All right, welcome back. We're going to take a look at the concepts of assignment 8.3. Let's start with what type of hazard is cigarette smoking categorized as? Go ahead and pause. All right, so it's a cultural hazard. It arises from choice, and different cultures have different views towards the risk of smoking. Some environmental health hazards. Um, we normally think of hazards as being synthetic and natural toxicants, but actually it includes physical hazards like floods and blizzards and landslides and radon gas and UV exposure, and chemical hazards like disinfectants that we might use in our home and pesticides we might apply to our crops, and biological hazards like viruses and bacterial infections. And of course, cultural and lifestyle hazards like drinking and smoking and bad diet and crime in neighborhood. So here's a breakdown of some, some big ones here. We'll study um, tropospheric ozone as a component of smog from cars, pesticide drift drifting into um, nearby playgrounds, dust and particulate matter. I saw a lot of that yesterday along Hollister Street, Hollister Avenue during construction. And water, we've talked a lot about pesticide and herbicide runoffs and nitrates and fertilizer runoffs. But mercury, arsenic, and other heavy metals in groundwater and surface water, which can arise from e-waste, for example, that's big. And in food, there are natural toxins. We know about poisonous mushrooms. There's also pesticide and herbicide residues. And indoors, we're exposed to lead in old paint. Um, also, some pipes use lead in the solder to connect together the pipe sections. And we also have things in plastics, especially compounds called phthalates. And um, radon is a radioactive gas that can seep into your home from the nearby rock. And, um, and asbestos is a component of insulation that they, or building materials in general, that they used to add to make them flame retardant. All right, so go ahead and pause. Which of the following is the largest causes of death to humans? Welcome back. So if you said infectious diseases, that's correct. We're talking about viral and bacterial diseases transmitted between individuals. And this is made more common today by worldwide travel. Here we see a breakdown of disease. Um, over, a quarter, over a quarter of death is caused by cardiovascular disease, heart disease, and usually that's from bad diet, not enough exercise, maybe smoking, too much stress. But um, we can see here about a quarter of it is due to infectious diseases. And that's the second leading cause of death worldwide. Here we see six diseases that account for 80% of infectious disease deaths. So we have like the flu, AIDS caused by the HIV virus, diarrhea diseases like Ebola, um, tuberculosis, malaria carried by mosquitoes, and measles and pertussis and things like that, per pertussis. The West Nile virus came on the scene about maybe 20 years ago, also called the bird flu. And it's transmitted from infected birds to humans via mosquitoes. So the mosquitoes are the vector. And it causes flu-like symptoms. It was first detected in the US in 1999 in the Northeast. And it took about five years for it to spread westward. Which of the following hazards is associated with old paint? And, uh, you probably know this answer already. It is, drum roll, lead. It is a heavy metal neurotoxin that affects normal brain development in children. It can also cause headaches, stomach pain, and anemia. Some people think that lead is what led to the demise of the Roman Empire because they used lead. Um, I think it was in their aqueducts and maybe in their bowls and things like that, like in their ceramics. But definitely if you're doing ceramics, you want to use a glaze that's lead free for sure. Here we see some hazmat people. Lots of health hazards indoors. We've already talked about these, except for the last one. PBDE, it's a chemical that's a fire retardant, and they include that chemical in the fibers of pajamas that they make for children. So consider that. Of the 100,000 synthetic chemicals on the market today, less than 10% are thoroughly tested. Actually, that number is significantly less than 10%, like maybe a few percent. And uh, some, some statistics here. Um, most of these chemicals are industrial. Some of them are pesticides. 2,000 new chemicals introduced per year. This is during the 90s, so I, I've heard this number is more like 700 now. Lots of food additives. So that means it's a synthetic chemical that we're adding into food. Synthetic meaning it is not natural. 
uh, living organisms have never seen it before. And um, it might be artificial flavors, artificial colors, things like that. Cosmetic ingredients, these are things that we're putting right around our eye, right around our lips, all areas or on top of our skin. And these are all areas that are very good entry points into the body where they can contaminate us. Here's a picture. I remember seeing this picture the first time uh, many years ago when I was in grad school and thinking, wow, spraying DDT all over bathers here. This is some bathers at Long Island um, beaches in Long Island, New York. And um, really, the rise of this happened after World War II. And we read about that a little bit with Rachel Carson. All right, so here's benzene. That's a chemical added to gasoline to make it burn more effectively. It causes cancer. We know that, but we still use it. So we've done a little cost and benefit analysis and figured it's better to use it than not to use it. But being that it causes cancer, it is a, drum roll, carcinogen. So, so here's the breakdown. Carcinogens cause cancer. Mutagens cause mutations in DNA. They can change that adenine to a guanine or a cytosine to a thy, what they call it, thymine or something like that. And that may lead to cancer. If you change the DNA of a gene whose job it is to, is to regulate the growth of the cell, then that cell can begin to grow and multiply uncontrollably, creating a tumor. Teratogens are chemicals that cause birth defects, so they are interfering with the growth of a fetus, making it grow abnormally. And allergens cause unnecessary immune response. Some of you might be experiencing allergies on spring days when there's a lot of pollen in the air. Pollen is not dangerous, but if our body thinks it's dangerous, it will mount a immune response. It'll make your eyes water, it'll make your nose run, all the things to try to get that pollutant from coming into your body. And I say pollutant, I could have said like toxin or whatever. Neurotoxins, they damage the nervous system. Um, you can start to go crazy from things like mercury poisoning or lead poisoning. And endocrine disruptors interfere with hormones. So here's another question for you. With the thinning of the ozone layer, organisms are exposed to more solar UV light than they used to. These high energy rays can change DNA in skin cells, making them, what? Uh, so making these chemicals mutagens because they're changing DNA. Accutane is a drug often given to high school students to reduce acne. I took that drug in high school. It causes birth defects, so any female going on it is required to take a pregnancy test. Therefore, it is a teratogen. And last one, synthetic perfumes and soap, deodorant, and other personal care products contain chemicals called phthalates. They are absorbed through the skin where their small concentrations can change bodily functioning and development. Therefore, they are called endocrine disruptors. And take a minute, pause, and check your matching on these. Should be pretty easy with what we just did. All right, here is the correct solution. One, four, three, five, two. Here's somebody, his name is Butch Lumpkin, whose mom took the drug thalidomide to relieve her, more, her um, what do you call it, um, uh, morning sickness during pregnancy. And it affected thousands of babies before being banned in the 1960s. So this is definitely a case of um, innocent until proven guilty as opposed to um, the precautionary principle, which would have said we need to test this chemical first before we give it. So what's the deal with endocrine, dis <clears throat> endocrine disruption? The way that cells work is you have a receptor in the cell wall, and when a molecule, like a hormone, comes and um, matches up with that receptor, it's kind of like a lock and a key. When they make that connection, then the cell has a response. And if you have a hormone mimic, means it's a different chemical like a pollutant, but if it has just the right enough shape, it can act as that key and cause the same response. And so um, that's the deal with those. I'm gonna skip ahead here. This phenyl A is um, a chemical added to plastics to make them more flexible. However, it's also an estrogen mimicker. And so if you look at these two chemicals, what do they have in similarity? They both have an OH group on the ends, and they both have a CH called a methyl group there. And apparently it's enough of a similarity in shape to cause, est to cause BPA to act like estrogen. 
And the thing about this is the hormone system is geared to working with tiny concentrations of hormones. It doesn't take much testosterone in your body to make your cells develop as a male. And because it works with such tiny concentrations, it can respond or is influenced by tiny concentrations of environmental contaminants. And uh, as far as that whole estrogen mimicry thing goes, we do see declining sperm counts since the 30s. And, you know, this is right around the time that these synthetic chemicals were beginning to be produced and entering our environment. And uh, if it goes, it goes from about 120 um, millions per milliliter of sperm fluid down to about 70. So, and this is back in 1992. So by now, 20 years later, um, I think sperm counts are at least half or even less than half of what they used to be. Testicular cancer, also in the rise, maybe related. So rank the following from um, most susceptible to environmental hazards to least. Go ahead and pause. All right, so definitely infants are the most susceptible. They put stuff in their mouths, they breathe more breaths per minute, they are still developing, so there's more opportunity for toxins to do damage. Elderly would come in second place. They have weakened immune systems. They have weakened liver function to break down toxins. That's the main role of the liver, or one of the main roles. And this is a diagram showing all the different ways that toxicants can get into our environment or move through the environment. Things like in our home, where we work, in hospitals, uh, chemicals we apply to farm fields, in our water, in our air, etc. But they all point back to where these chemicals were made in a chemical manufacturing plant. And just so you know, my dad worked for a chemical company for 35 years, brought food to our table, paid my way through college. Um, so, you know, I see lots of sides to it. But um, we can't deny that we're making synthetic chemicals that living organisms have never seen before. And so there's bound to be um, unexpected consequences. Uh, okay, let's go to the next one. We talk about how many of these toxicants can concentrate in water. Because next time it rains, if you applied some chemicals to this um, field to perhaps kill some weeds, that chemical is going to get washed into the local riverway. And the idea of watershed, it can take a very large um, area of land to drain into a very small area of water and in that way it becomes concentrated. All right, let's talk about the grasshopper effect. It's, um, we see here the Inuit people and their bodies are heavily contaminated. They have the highest body burden of anyone on the planet, meaning they are carrying around the most number of chemicals in their tissues. And one especially that we're concerned about is called PCBs. It's an industrial chemical. It's used in electronics um, as, a, um, as, an, as, a, as a liquid that's also an insulator and can help heat to um, transfer out. I'll just give you one quick example. When you are driving down the street and you see these transformers, they're like cans hanging from the telephone poles. Um, they have PCBs inside of them to help conduct the heat outside so that they don't overheat. But the point is that many of these are developed, uh, are manufactured, developed and manufactured and used in the industrialized parts of the world, which are more in the temperate regions where people want to live. But these chemicals get into the environment and they travel to the um, poles where they concentrate and they get into the food chain of the Inuit people. And so how does that happen? Take a moment here and pause and see if you can figure it out. Okay, welcome back. So. Atmospheric and oceanic currents, yes. Higher rates of evaporation in temperate areas, yes. Higher rates of deposition in Arctic areas, yes. Let's take a look at this graphic. So this is where they're being used and developed in temperate regions. And um, they get up into the atmosphere through evaporation. Uh, and then they get carried by atmospheric currents. When they get into the colder areas, it's colder. So then they deposit, they, they come down in the form of precipitation. Um, and so that's the basic process. Evaporate, get carried, and deposit. And because it's cold up here, they're not evaporating as quickly as they're depositing, so they accumulate. Also, oceanic currents carry them as well. And poisons accumulate in tissues. That's the big deal here. The body may excrete, degrade, or store toxicants. Those are basically the three things that can happen. If it is a fat-soluble 
um, poison, it's going to be stored in your body fat and you're not going to excrete it. And those are the most dangerous. If it's um, not fat soluble, then your body can pretty easily pass it through your urine. And, um, and if it's degradable, then your liver can work on it and break it down and then you excrete the byproducts. DDT, unfortunately, is persistent, meaning that it stays in the environment for a long time. UV light um, and uh, what else? Heat are not able to break it down very well. And oxygen, for that matter, it doesn't oxidize very quickly. It is also fat soluble, therefore, it builds up in tissues. We, we call that bioaccumulation. And bioaccumulated chemicals may be passed on to animals that eat the organisms on up the food chain. So go ahead and pause for a minute. Which of the following statements about bioaccumulation and biomagnification are true? All right, let's see how you did. So mercury bioaccumulates, yes. Uh, this would be true if we change bone tissue to fatty tissue. Moving up the food chain, uh, it doesn't double, it increases by a factor of 10x. And it goes back to that um, idea about 90% heat loss. So you have to basically eat like 10 times that below you. And biomagnification only occurs when bioaccumulation occurs. That's a true statement. Um, and bioaccumulation helps explain why many toxins persist in the environment. That's true. They persist inside living organisms, so they are still in the environment. And they exist just in the environment, in the water and whatnot. Here's a little video of bioaccumulation. I don't know if this is going to work. Let me try. I hope it doesn't crash my computer. Oh, yeah. So this little fish is just picking up these little DDT molecules, or maybe it's methylmercury, or maybe something else, and um, accumulating it. All right, and it goes over and over. Let's take a look at the next one, biomagnification. So they're swimming along. They already contain the DDT, or whatever it might be. Now here comes big, bad, um, carnivore fish and as he's going around eating them he's also incorporating their pollutants into his own body and because he's eating so many he's getting a lot of toxins accumulating in fact we can start to see that the concentration in his body is getting more than the concentration of the fish he's eating this is bio magnification all right, let's pause there and take a look at the next slide. So these poisons move up the food chain. And we can see that's roughly a factor of 10x as we go up um, with each step. 2 times 10 is 25. 0.04 times 10 is 0.5 roughly. Okay. So uh, let's go. This is a little slide I want to show you. When we're talking about mercury, uh, mercury, the chemical symbol is Hg. But usually what happens is it forms methyl mercury, which is methane is CH4, but you take off one of the H's and you replace it with an HG, a mercury. And now it's in a form that's even more readily absorbed into the body because now it's actually in hydrocarbon form. So it's more similar to our own body chemistry. And that's bad. Um, it's going to make it harder for our body to excrete it. And I want to point out here too, we get some synergism happening here because um, mercury gets deposited in sediments. So in water that also has a lot of sediment or turbidity, you get a synergistic effect where the mercury sticks to the sediments and therefore sticks around longer. And just keep in mind that all, not all toxicants are synthetic. And here we see um, a poisonous mushroom. Okay, um, it's, it's wrong to say that only man produces toxic things. It's full of things in the environment that are like that. Um, okay, I think that's a wrap. All right, you guys, I'll see you in class.